In my first Kingdom Hearts related video on the channel back in 2019, I shared 90 obscure quirks and oddities about KH1, my favorite game in the series and my favorite game ever. Clearly that well runs extremely deep as not long after I did a follow up with another 25 facts and a year later another 13. You can watch all of those here, if you want, I guess, but fair warning, I am a timid little dork in that first one, like even more so than I am right now. Regardless, you might think I'd have fewer things to share this time over two years since the last installment, but today I've got 30 things I've learned since the last time we did this song and dance. And that was the self-imposed criteria I gave myself, I'm only including things that I learned after the last video, and not stretching to include things I was definitely conscious of but chose not to include last time because I didn't think they were interesting enough. Like, here's a freebie, Bahamut was supposed to be a summon, but he was cut, and if you like, hack your game to get him to appear in the summon list, the game crashes upon selection. You're gonna get that in like, every video about obscure KH1 things, and I knew about that when I was like, two, before KH1 came out somehow. A handful of these things were brought up in the comments of part 3, and I'll try to give credit where I can, but some other stuff I've just learned through Twitch chat over the past two years and I don't fully remember where they came from. Obviously, I am not the first to discover any of these things, I'm just putting them all in one place. Well, I guess four places. One playlist, at least. Alright, enough preamble, let's get to the first obscure item on our list. I really can't believe I stumbled across another thing I didn't know about in the relatively small dive to the heart, but here we are. As you may know, this fight against Darkseid is not win or die, you can lose all your HP and still proceed to Destiny Islands. Unlike the other losable battles like Leon, Cloud, and Sabor 1, the cutscene after Darkseid is the same regardless of if you win or lose. The music that plays in the cutscene, however, is different. In a winning scenario, which is the version you get in theater mode, Distati slows down and becomes calmer, but upon losing, the song remains in its faster-paced quote-unquote battle mode. It's a neat little detail to still alter the vibe of the cutscene without having to change any animations. So I have a lot of Destiny Islands text bubble things that I guess I just never bothered to look at when I played the game growing up because I wasn't really thinking about talking to the same characters over and over. But if you do choose to bother your friends, they'll give you some fun flavor text that's often missed. For example, continuing to refuse Titus's request for a duel will eventually lead to him mentioning that he and Waka have been working on creating a new game where everyone fights for a ball underwater. He then goes on to say that Sora and Riku will never be star players like he is. And in fairness, he is the star player of the Xanarkand Abes, who played a very similar sounding sport, Blitzball, in Final Fantasy X. I'm completely fine with not achieving stardom, because while I love FF10, I fucking hate Blitzball. There's even some continuity within KH regarding this, as in KH2, Selfie will comment on Titus and Waka getting wrapped up in their ballgame. Probably trying to play enough matches to get to Jupiter's sigil, the poor bastards. Speaking of Selfie, she has some pretty funny dialogue on Day 2. Talking to her the first time gets you the voiced cutscene where she gives you some pow poo fruit lore. If you keep talking to her but choose not to battle, she'll eventually ask you again if you know about the legendary power of the pow poo fruit. Which you should, considering she just told you about it, but there might not be a ton going on in Sora's head here. If you respond yeah, she comments that she thinks she can do better than Titus or Waka. Which, fucking rude. I mean, she can definitely do better than Waka, but Titus is the star player of the Xander Abes. He's probably just not mentioning that enough, I'm sure she'll come around. Believe it or not, I never really talked to Kairi beyond the mandatory conversations about the wrap materials and provisions, so I didn't know that she had so much to say. On the second day, she actually has different dialogue depending on whether you win or lose the race, and she'll mention the name of the wrapped as well, regardless of who wins. If Riku won, she'll ask if that makes him captain, and if Sora won, she'll ask the same, but she adds an aye aye Captain Sora and a little salute, which is fucking adorable. Also, on both days, you can ask Kairi for hints on where to find the items you need. If you claim that you're a little lost, she'll give you a general nudge in the right direction, and if you say you're totally clueless, she'll basically tell you exactly where you need to go. Saying you're a little lost on day two can result in her mentioning that she likes coconut milk but dislikes mushrooms, which I think is the only example of KH characters having specific food preferences. Now again, I never really asked for help when trying to find the materials, so I had no idea that doing so means Kairi actually doesn't give you a high potion at the end of the day. I always thought it was just a given, but I guess she just isn't impressed with you if you ask for assistance and keeps the potion to herself. Yeah, well, we'll see how much good that does ya. Stopping down in Traverse Town for the next few, when in the green room after the Leon fight, attempting to leave to the alleyway or hallway will result in Leon saying, just can't sit still, can ya? 
Maybe he was right to have his doubts about Sora, he can't seem to follow basic instructions. I can't believe I was totally oblivious to this one for so long, but you probably know about the fireplace inside the accessory shop. I always just figured it was to serve as a little example of how you can use magic to interact with the environment. Which it is, but I didn't realize lighting the fireplace also actually makes the chimney outside produce smoke, and putting the fire out stops the smoke. This game is so fucking charming. Shout out to Formal Gibble in the comments for pointing this one out. Here's some more text bubble stuff. A lot of the first district NPCs have a dialogue that updates as you progress through the game. For example, after the guard armor fight, the knockoff Titus will ask if you're the one who took out that big armor thing. And after saving Kyrie, the woman near the cafe will mention that fewer refugees have been arriving lately, and she wonders if it's because the shadows are weakening or fewer people are escaping their worlds, which is a sobering thought. But my favorite piece of dialogue here is from the Moogle, who, after sealing Traverse Town's keyhole, demands that people stop trying to touch his pom pom. I knew about that, but I didn't know that after completing Monstro, he'll add on that Pinocchio keeps trying to touch his pom-pom too, which I'm obsessed with. I just love the idea of Pinocchio terrorizing an innocent Moogle and chasing him around the first district. And judging from the credits, this didn't impede his chances at becoming a real boy, so I say get all your pom-pom touches in, you only live once. This one is fairly minor, although I guess all of these are, but I never knew that in the gummy ship, holding R1 actually locks the aiming reticle in place, allowing you to move the ship around without firing directly in front of you. I don't ever really take advantage of it, but it's still kinda neat. Stopping in Wonderland for a sec, this is something of a follow-up to one from the previous video, but last time I talked about how this grate on the stove in the bazaar room can be hit and you can cast fire on it to light the stovetops. Which, beyond it being a neat little thing to do, mostly serves as a self-inflicted debuff for the Trick Master fight as it just lets the boss skip having to light the stove himself. As pointed out by several commenters, the obvious next step is to try casting Blizzard on it, which you'd only have at this point if you got it from the Cheshire Cat for finding all of the evidence. Naturally, this extinguishes the flames and keeps the Trick Master from using his most powerful attacks. Hopping over to Olympus Coliseum, an easy-to-miss feature in the Coliseum gates is this pair of message boards near the world exit. There's always one of these green boards near the entrance to the lobby that generally gives updates on Sora's progress through the tournaments. However, these two near the exit are only ever present in between tournaments being unlocked. They first show up after beating Cerberus on the first visit and they advertise the fill cup, but disappear once the fill cup is actually unlocked. The same thing happens for the Pegasus and Hercules Cups. I figure they're fairly obscure since most players aren't coming back to the Coliseum in between worlds unless Chippendale tell them about a new tournament, by which time these message boards will have vanished again. Next up, we have a few in Deep Jungle, starting with the Sabor fight. I only truly realized this when scripting part 2 of my Heartless Kill Count video, but there is a slightly altered cutscene when you lose to Sabor, or rather when your HP gets low enough for the fight to end. I always knew about the Cloud and Leon alternate scenes, but the Sabor one just flew under my radar for some reason. On the topic of Sabor, and this is the one exception to my rule from the start of the video, as I did know about it before the first video, but I consistently forgot to include it, basically there are only two four Sabor fights, one in the treehouse and one in the bamboo thicket. But before the Heartless show up in Deep Jungle, you can fight Sabor as many times as you want in the treehouse, the camp, and the cliff. Going back to the treehouse will cause Sabor to break its floor, leaving a permanent hole there for the rest of the game. There are heated debates over whether or not a true 100% file has the Sabor hole in the treehouse or not, as on one hand it's a missable addition to the deep jungle environment, but on the other you end up with less net treehouse if you have the hole version. Speaking of net, you can in fact get Sabor to fall through the hole onto the net and she'll run off into the jungle below after you defeat her. Back at the camp, you probably know about the research notes and recipe cards you can find to cook a high potion and concoct an ether. What I somehow failed to realize for years is that you only need two research nodes to make the ether at the chemistry set, one at the clothesline and one at the globe. Now, I always knew that there was a third research note at the phonograph, but it never really registered with me that this is an optional note that actually replicates the ether instead of just giving you one. This is mostly a matter of me just mashing through the text and not realizing that you get two ethers if you collect all three cards and then do the experiment. Last thing in Deep Jungle is this useful progression hint from Jane. She'll actually tell you where all the gorillas you need to rescue are, and her hint updates with each gorilla you save. She starts by worrying about the gorillas in the treehouse, and if you defeat the Power Wilds there, her dialogue updates to be concerned about the ones at the cliff. This continues for the gorillas in the bamboo thicket and the climbing trees. There's no hint about the ones at the camp since they're the mandatory first encounter, and she doesn't know that they're in danger at that point. Here's one in Agrabah I found out about while doing work for the Wayfinder project. Since the Pot Centipede boss can crawl throughout almost all of the ground level areas in Agrabah, it can be defeated in several different places. 
The theater mode version shows the party in the Main Street area when the centipede is killed as part of the cutscene titled Wish Number 2. However, you can also kill the centipede in the alley, the plaza, and the palace gates, and the following cutscene actually reflects that instead of teleporting you to one fixed location. Heading over to Atlantica, there is another hint for a fairly infamous KH1 progression barrier which involves the dolphin. A lot of first-time players don't know how to progress to the sunken ship area, but talking to Flounder in Ariel's Grotto results in him basically giving you the solution. He says, there's this really big fish who can swim against the current, but he's scared of those weird things swimming around, so if we chase them away, I think the big fish will play with us. Maybe if you grab onto him, he'll take you somewhere. Side note, it's insane that Flounder's dialogue consistently updates throughout the world despite just sitting in the grotto the entire time. He has different and exclusive things to say before the Crystal Trident is destroyed, after that but before the Gold Trident is stolen, after that but before the first Ursula fight, after the first Ursula fight but before the second, after sealing the keyhole, and after leaving the world and coming back when it's completed. Like, just an insane amount of polish and attention to detail, and this applies for a handful of other characters in the game like Dr. Finkelstein or Travis the accessory shop clerk in Traverse Town. This next one in Halloween Town goes all the way back to number 55 in the original video where I mentioned how unlike every other Disney world in the game, the citizens of Halloween Town already know what the Heartless are before meeting Sora. This is obviously evident from the Doctor doing an experiment on a search ghost, but they also refer to the Heartless by their actual name instead of what most characters tend to say, which is usually just shadows or strange creatures. I finally realized that the mayor actually has missable dialogue where he reveals that Jack found a book about the Heartless. It's super easy to miss since he only says this after Jack makes his grand entrance, but before agreeing to unlock the artificial heart in the lab. On top of that, the Jack scene is triggered by walking toward the lab, so once the cutscene is over, the player is likely to just go back toward the lab again and miss these text bubbles. And you need to talk to him twice for him to mention the book, so it really is some pretty tucked away lore. And I have no idea what to make of it, but I'm wondering if maybe the book was like, planted by Oogie who has knowledge of the Heartless from Maleficent and he does have a page of Ansem's report after all. Maybe it was all part of a gambit to get the Doctor to try and make the artificial heart, but this is assuredly just another weird KH1 thing like Triton knowing about the Keyblade, and we'll definitely never get concrete answers on this. Over at the Moonlight Hill, while I did know that you can light these pumpkin bombs using fire, it was news to me that you can change your mind and use Blizzard on them to keep them from exploding once ignited. Remember when you could use magic to interact with the environment on like, a consistent basis? Those were good times. This one in Neverland is something I've shown off before in a video or two, but I only learned about it after the last obscure KH1 video. In the first video, I showed off Hook's reaction to having fire cast on him, but he also has a unique response to being thundered, where he sort of uses his sword as a lightning rod and negates any damage. They end up maintaining continuity with this in Chain of Memories, both the game and the novel, where in the game, some secondary effects of Hook's enemy card grants you resistance to thunder attacks in exchange for being stunned by fire attacks. And in the novel, Donald casts Thundara on Hook, which only seems to annoy Hook instead of hurt him. Staying on the deck of the Jolly Roger, and this was pointed out in the comments by Jay Dizzle, the map on the table at the helm depicts an island that's actually consistent with how Neverland is depicted throughout the Peter Pan franchise. This is opposed to the map texture inside the captain's cabin, which is much more generic and different from the one up top. Once again, going back to the original video, number 65 pointed out this letter in Rabbit's mailbox, and I focused on how the envelope says Mickey Mouse and is reused from the cutscene in Disney Castle at the beginning of the game. But the contents of the letter when examining it actually change throughout the game. After playing each minigame, the letter's text and sometimes even the author changes. Three of the letters are signed Pooh, but there's a letter from Tigger after playing Block Tigger and a letter from Rue after playing Tigger's Giant Pot. The first letter comes from Pooh, which says, I hope we'll be finding more honey together soon, and the final letter also comes from Pooh, which updates once you've cleared the minigame requirements to get Sora's cheer ability. That one reads, Everyone had a good time with you, even Owl. I have no idea why Owl is catching strays here, if anything you'd think Eeyore would be the pick for this spot, but there you go. Some more Hundred Acre Wood stuff, the Pooh's Honey Hunt and Block Tigger minigames have quote-unquote canon cutscenes in theater mode. The former's is called Piglet, which includes Sora meeting Piglet, followed by Pooh eating honey in the Tree Hollow, aka the end result of the minigame if you get a score of 100 licks or higher. But there's actually two additional voiced cutscenes for getting middle of the road and low scores. Here's the scene for getting 50 to 99 licks. Oh, that was yummy in my tummy, but there is room for a bit more. And here's the scene for getting 49 or fewer. Oh, bother. That didn't go too well. Likewise, the canon result for Block Tigger is the theater mode cutscene titled Bounce Roonies, but this too has additional scenes for mid and bad scores. Here's the cutscene for a mid tier score of 75 to 149. Say, hey, you kept up pretty good there, Sora, especially for a non Tigger. Let's have another go. <laughs> 
And here's the scene for a score of 74 or less. <laughs> How about those bouncerones? Well, they were good even for a tiger. <laughs> I absolutely have to include this one, which was shown to me by longtime viewer Mr. Shiverburn. In part 3 of this series, I showed off the breakable rock near the raft on Destiny Islands. Well, this big block here in the base level area of Hollow Bastion works the same exact way, and this time you can break it right beneath Donald's feet. And in the event that you got to Hollow Bastion without high jump, the game saves you from getting stuck here by having this crystal that respawns the block. This one comes from a comment by Sky Raiders on the last video, which links to a video by Fisteria Nya. That video already has over 200,000 views and was posted back in 2017, so I won't spend too much time on it. I encourage you to check out the original video, which is just about a minute long and linked in the description. But I found this really cool. In short, the background color when you pause is determined by whatever color is in the exact middle of the screen. For example, if you pause here with a castle wall in the center, the background is a beige color. If we move the camera to have the crystal in the center of the screen, our background is now noticeably a much brighter red. Or here, we have Goofy's arm in the middle for a green pause screen, his vest for a black background, and the sky for a pinkish orange. Pretty cool stuff. Heading back to Traverse Town, after rescuing Kyrie and going to the secret waterway, you can talk to Kyrie before collecting the hidden Navi G piece in the mural. Talking to her once prompts her to talk about the mural, but talking to her a second time results in her saying the same exact line she says when Sora hallucinates her in Merlin's house earlier in the game. Which means she describes Merlin's house, the waterway, and the secret place as musty. I guess that was just her word of the day when the islands fell to darkness. This one I found when perusing the KH wiki, specifically the page for the 99 puppies. According to page 131 of the KH1 Ultimania, some of the puppies are actually matched up to specific numbers. It notes that number 5 is Patch, 6 is Rolly, 13 is Pepper, 23 is Penny, and 69 is Freckles. Puppy number 12 is Lucky, which is the one who watches TV in the Dalmatian's den. Finally, and I've saved my favorite for last, you could probably consider this the rarest text bubble in the game. This was first shown to me by Chaney, and I tweeted a video of this quite a while ago. But upon synthesizing everything you possibly can in the item workshop, the Moogle closest to the door has this to say. You little bastard. I hope Pinocchio slaps you in the pom-pom. Hey, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed. It was nice getting back to the bread and butter of the channel, like the origin point for everything here. So I had a lot of fun with that. Hope you did as well. It's crazy to think I uploaded that first one with, uh, I think, zero subscribers um, as a hobby in the summer of uh, 2019. Did not expect to be doing part four of it, uh, you know, three years later, but here we are. I can't count. That's four years. Jeez. <laughs> well, if you liked the video, it would mean a lot to me if you would express it with a little thumb button down there. And also subscribe if you want to see new stuff from me. And if you really, really enjoy, check me out on patreon.com slash regular pop. Best way to support me. Um, it's good stuff. You get some additional videos as well. I guess that's important to point out. And of course, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Discord. I'm on Twitch. Regularpat.com for everything you might need from me. And things you don't need from me as well. Alright, that's all for me. Take it easy. Stay safe out there. And I'll see you next time. Bye.